This is DeliveranceMinistry.fm videocast episode 7. Hello everyone, welcome once again to another episode of DeliveranceMinistry.fm where we give you proven insights about the demonic realm and deliverance ministry so you can wage spiritual warfare more effectively. This is Dr. Don Ibbotson, and I'm here once again with my co-host and colleague, uh, Dr. Phyllis Tarbox. Hello, yep. Phyllis. How are you today? Hi, Don. I'm good. Thanks. I like this topic. We're going to talk today about the, uh, really give an overview of the demonic realm. Um, how do demons operate in the earthly realm? And for us as believers, why is it important to know our enemy? Before I get into that, I just want to uh, encourage you to stay tuned till the very end of this podcast. I'm going to tell you about a giveaway that we have where you can receive a free gift just for re, uh, releasing or if you'd like and or preparing and, and leaving a review for us on iTunes. So we'll get to that at the very end. Phyllis, you and I have been involved in deliverance ministry, spiritual warfare for a long time. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I'm amazed at, quite frankly, is how a little understanding that people have, and I'm talking churchgoers, mm-hmm. Christians, believers, mm-hmm. how little understanding uh, people have of the demonic realm. How did we get into that situation? I, I don't I I believe that Satan does not want us to know about this stuff, Don. I mean, like we've talked about it before. I got used to wake up at Five, when I was five years old and walked to church on Pentecost Street. And I'd been in church my whole life and never heard anything about spiritual warfare. Um, churches didn't teach it. And, you know, it stirred a righteous anger in me, quite frankly, to want to be able to get this word out. And, you know, I'm sure that's God's purpose for my life. But nonetheless, I didn't hear about it. It didn't get taught in churches. A lot of churches don't want to scare people. They don't want to bring it up. They don't want to stir the devils up. And so it just doesn't get taught. And I think it's so sad. I've heard somebody say, I wish I could give them credit for it. If I could remember who'd say one of the two big deceptions, uh, that Satan has been able to work on the world is number one, many people, even believers don't believe he exists. Right. And the second thing is he said, well, he's defeated. Jesus beat him on the cross. So you don't need to worry about the yeah, devil anymore. Yeah. Hear that all the time. We, we hear that too. And we're going to, we're going to address those things because, uh, because of that, you know, people are getting taken out. Hosea 4, 6, uh, very scripture. Jesus, uh, God talks about an old Testament scripture, but still true today. Mm-hmm. He says, my people, that is God's people. Yes. The church perish for lack of knowledge. And, right. and I, I agree. It's, it's, I guess, anger, your righteous anger. If we could say that is the right word. It's just so sad. People come in with so little understanding of the demonic realm because mm-hmm. they haven't been taught. Right. And they don't want to scare people. People, many times we go to church, they want to hear a good message, a mm, positive feel good faith message, and yeah. grace. And I get that. And that is the good news. <laughs> it is good. But yeah. the reality is, and I, even as I say it, I, I recognize many people will, will, um, disagree even with the concept of even talking much about the demonic realm. They say that, that we don't need to do that. Why should we focus on the demonic realm? Mm-hmm. Let's just focus on Jesus because he's defeated the enemy. Right. The war is over. What do you re- what do you respond? Well, to that? personally, I like to focus on Jesus. I mean, I don't want to focus and meditate on the demonic realm yes. either. But you know, when you when you talk about Jesus, he did not ignore the devil or his schemes. I mean, he was quite concerned about his children dying, like you said, for lack of knowledge. And you know, as we look at it, one third of his time was spent teaching the disciples on how to handle demons. I mean, we talk about how he came to preach, he came to heal. And he came to deliver, right? Right. And so we talked to him about he's the original PhD. We call him Dr. Jesus, right? But um, he, he, he told them while he was here that it was part of his mission to set the captives free. He talked about that in Luke 4 where he unrolled the scroll in, of Isaiah 61 and he, and he talked about what his mission statement was. And then as we've talked about this, when he left, he told us in Mark 16, verses 16 through 18, I believe it was, or 15 through 18, that, that we, these signs would follow believers that we will cast out demons in his name. And so the last thing Jesus did was to ignore the devil and his schemes. Now he didn't meditate on him. He didn't focus on him. He didn't live his life constantly battling him, but there was a portion of his ministry. One third of it, I would suggest to you that was focused on deliverance. Now, 
if you, you know, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I've heard some scholars say that if you actually count the number of healings that were done by deliverance in the New Testament, you'll see that it's about one third of the total. Mm, wow. So I believe it was a great, great focus of his as far as um, his mission. So, no, we cannot ignore it. And, and quite frankly, and like I say, we're not here to try, this is not an apologist, um, the, um, uh, podcast. We're not trying to do, you know, theological analysis here. It's to us, it's quite simple in terms of what Jesus did. He said, if you, you know, you will do the same things that I've been right. doing, faith in me. And, and part of it was indeed doing deliverance ministry. And right. we believe that is for today. And that even though the victory has been won on the cross, yes, there, it is, has. there is still, some warfare mm-hmm. that needs to happen in terms right. of and includes deliverance. And, right. um, so, you know, we're, we're pretty adamant about that, obviously, that, that spiritual warfare is for today. And quite frankly, if you're going to be engaged in it, whether it's like any kind of warfare, you need to know your enemy. You need to understand mm-hmm. how do they work. And I agree with you. We're not, you know, we should never be Jesus folk, or I'm sorry, <laughs> we should never be demon focused. Right. Deliverance ministry, of course, is the driving out of demons, but we, we need to be Jesus focused. But we do need, if we're going to engage in spiritual warfare we need to understand uh the nature of our enemy that's right on, on some level because and, we and are in a war we, we're in a war we're engaging in these battles and we tell people your the spiritual warfare ends if jesus comes back or if you die then our warfare is over but up until either one of those takes place <laughs> we're going to be involved in in spiritual that's warfare right. on some level and so this purpose of this podcast is really to just to to give you hopefully some practical um nuts and bolts knowledge uh, about the, the demonic realm um we talked about a lot of what's taught in church and what i find is is sometimes not not so much that it's necessarily that what something i would disagree with or not necessarily wrong but it's not very complete it's not detailed enough and it doesn't go into some of the aspects aspects of spiritual warfare in terms of discerning spirits, resisting spirits, of course, driving out spirits. Mm-hmm. And so we just want to focus on delivering or giving to you in this session, just some things we've learned and biblically based things and experiential things mm-hmm. that we've learned and seen about the demonic realm in terms of dealing with them over the course of many years of counseling and deliverance ministry. So with that kind of preamble and beginning, let's talk about the um, the nature of demons. What do we? What does the Bible tell us about demonic spirits? I mean, what do we know about demon spirits? Well, they're finite. They're created angelic beings. They 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 have um, you know they can't be everywhere at every time. You know, a lot of times people will say Satan was in my bedroom or something like that. And we know that Satan is a single entity. Can't be everywhere all the time. Like God can, God can be omnipotent through the power of the Holy spirit. But, but, um, you know, and omnipresent everywhere, all omnipresent, the time. right. Yep. But Creek, but, but demons are like angels, you know, they're, they're, they're fallen angels and they're in a, in, a, in a certain place at a certain time. They they can't be everywhere. And we know that a third of them fell with Satan. People yes. ask, well, how many angels are there? The Bible talks about a multitude and a countless number. So it's a big number, but we believe the ratio is a third of them fell. Right. Revelation 12 says Revel- a third a third of them fell with, with, with Satan with little time and with great fury. So the one thing that they have here is they know that they have very little time and they're trying to get as many souls for their kingdom as they possibly can. And there is the, and the, the second heaven that talks about, it's, the scripture talks about principalities and demon princes. It talks in the book of Daniel about the prince of Persia in the second heaven and the third heaven. We know where Paul was taken to, what we would consider the throne room of heaven. We, we live here in this earthly realm, what we would call the first heaven. And that's where Jesus lived. Right. And walked as a man. Right. right. And this is where he did deliverance ministry. And that's where we live in place. So, or live, work in place. So that's our focus in terms of understanding the demonic realm. In, in the earthly realm. And then when we talk about the nature of demons, we want these devils to understand who it is we're up against in this earthly realm. So we know they're created beings. Mm-hmm. Um, they're here. They've got a plan for our right. life. It talks in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Right. So that's what these devils are about. Um, there is a hierarchy in the demonic realm too. You know, it talks about in Matthew about the binding the strong yeah. man and there is a, there's a hierarchy and, and there's a high, similarly, if you look in scripture about angels, not all angels are the same. There's Michael, Gabriel, the, the, with archangels and there's, you know, cherubim, seraphim. So we're just focusing in on the demonic realm that we do spiritual warfare. Um, 
against, if you like. And we want you to, there's, there's two scriptures that we really want to focus on here in the next few minutes. And if you have a pen and if you can, and you want to come back to this later and listen that, or write this down, that'd be great. But there's, there's two of them in, the, in the New Testament, Matthew 12 verses 43, God puts in life and Luke 11, 24 to 26. Two scriptures, but they say, if you read them, they're essentially the same uh, text and context. And we're kind of of the view that anything God puts in scripture two times. Got to have importance. Probably, probably <laughs> important. So yeah. let me just read this to you. Read. I'm going to read out of Matthew 12, 43 to 45. And then we'll go through and uh, look at the scripture. It says this. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, there is so much Mm -hmm. information about Mm -hmm. the demonic realm Mm -hmm. in this scripture, Mm -hmm. and it's amazing. And you've touched on it, and uh, they, they also that that most um, churches don't talk much about the spiritual mm-hmm. warfare, the demonic realm. Don't talk much about this scripture, but let's go through this scripture and look at what it says. What can we learn for it? First of all, spirit says it comes out. Yeah, the spirit comes out of the man. So then you know that it's in. I mean, it's not a question. Jesus walked all through Matthew casting spirits out. And so, you know, that's where we come in for deliverance is those spirits have to come out of the man. That's a key. That's a key. And that is for us. It's for believers. It's for today. Mm -hmm. Spirits still need to come out of people. Now, yes, Mm -hmm. people will say there's an element of resisting spirits and they will flee. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But that, but, but the realm of deliverance is a driving out of spirits. They need to come out of a person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then it says it goes to dry er, through arid places. You know, that's typically in our practice in limits. That's where we send them. We mm-hmm. t- send the spirits yeah. to dry and not help. Right, right. But it says that these spirits seek rest. What can we learn from spirits seeking rest? Well, then they must get tired, right? Like if they've been cast out of their, their earthly dwelling and they now they're, you know, not getting the torment that they're supposed to be exacting over this, then, you know, there's a, there's a battle with them. They're, t- they get tired. They, they have, therefore they have mental and emotional things that are going on in them. And so they must have souls, right? They can think, they can reason, they can, they can exact torment over a person. They need rest. And so yeah, there's a soul tired. They don't have physical bodies, so they no. can't get physically tired, but they need, right. I think right. Mental and emotional rest mm-hmm. of some kind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what they're seeking. And, mm-hmm. and you touched on it. It says, you know, the, the next script in verse 44, it says, then the spirit says, I will return to the house. So spirits have minds. Yep. Right? They can reason. Mm-hmm. They can think. Mm-hmm. And they can, um, then it warns us, it says that the spirit's going to try to come back to the house. Well, we would understand in context that that house means that's the, the, the body that they were driven out of. Right. right? They're going to mm-hmm. try to come back. Come back. So we kind of a prophetic, prophetic warning, which emphasizes how important it is for people to be prepared and mm-hmm. be able to discern mm-hmm. when the spirits try to come mm-hmm. back. So they have minds, they have, they have wills and they can communicate with one another mm-hmm. because it says it takes along seven other spirits more wicked than itself. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And yeah. so, and then they, it talks about that they will go in and live there. Now, what do we, it, well, important to emphasize, it says seven other spirits more wicked than itself. What does that say about spirits? Well, that there is a hierarchy in the spiritual realm and that there are some that have exact greater torment on people than others do, right? Yeah, it's like, they're not, I think that's it. They're not all created equal. Um, and, and conceptually, if you look at it, it says a person maybe had one spirit, he got kicked out. That spirit brings along seven other spirits. So conceivably, they had one. If the doors are open or reopen, mm. they come back in, and now there's eight spirits. There's eight. So you could. It's not hard to visualize that. Yes, indeed, they would be worse off than they were be before. And and I think you know that this people point at the scripture, and, and we can also discern it says that if it finds it unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order, that um, that if the house is unoccupied, for us that says that the person needs to get. 
filled, be filled oh, with yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. We need to have the Holy Spirit. It needs to be occupied. Yes. And and for us, that's important. And I think most most would agree with this that 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 for us, even in doing deliverance, we really only want to do deliverance for people uh, who are believers who have the Holy Spirit in the house. Right. Because if that, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Then it's very going to be very very difficult. First of all, to get free and to stay free. Yeah, because you know, and the, and the point of deliverance is to allow the Holy Spirit to have you know the room it needs. I like to say to be really functional in fullness of joy and love and peace and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I know that when I went through one of my deliverances early on, that was that was what I what I recognized was is almost as if the Holy Spirit was just reaching out and going, oh, and giving it a good stretch. Now there's room for me. Now now there's room for me in this house. In yes. All right. That's a good picture. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Yeah. There's no less. Of, you don't have any more God than you do before. Did before, but you have less of this other stuff. Right. And right. So, and then you feed the Holy Spirit by staying in the Word. So then you then you see those things manifest in your life that are good and godly. That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah. So in a perfect. that scripture tells us a lot. Like I said, look at that. Read through it again. It tells a lot about devils. Some are more wicked that they're going to try to come back to the house. And so, um, so we learn a lot from them mm-hmm. about how they're operating. Now, okay, this is good. We got this knowledge. Why is this knowledge important? What's the scripture that we can point to that says how these demons operate in the plan that they have for us? Well, they don't have a very good plan. I can tell you that. And we note that through John 10, 10, because it says they've come to kill, to steal and destroy. There's no part of that that sounds good or to me. And like you said, Don, they want us to think their thoughts and they want us to believe that their thoughts are our thoughts. So there can be this bringing us into rationalizing and justifying that these thoughts are actually ours when they come, because like you've told us several times that they can't read our minds, but they can put those thoughts in. Right. And scripture points out that even when God asked, God asked Adam, who told you to eat that apple? Somebody else gave him that thought. That was an inspired thought. Of course, we know it was from the serpent. It was from Satan himself. And that was the original sin. And that original sin was not his thought. And that, that, that plan right from the very beginning was to bring enmity or division between God and man, separate us with lie based thinking. And that's what Satan does. He's a great deceiver. And so he wants us to think that a lot of this stuff is our thoughts because the demons can think and they can communicate that plan and they're very, they're very tricky. So we so want to be put able those to thoughts in our mind. Yeah. It puts the thoughts in. So we need to discern those lies because we are in a battle with this. And this is the battle thing. Exactly. I think that's point emphasizing there. This is spiritual warfare. They're still out to kill, steal, and yes, destroy. Yes, very much and so. Looking in the scripture talks about these Satan. Or, and we would extend the term. People say, look at Satan. We say, look, we're battling, you know, as you touched on, Satan's a finite being. I don't think we're battling Satan. We're battling these demonic spirits. There's, there's a few of them. There's spirits mm-hmm. assigned to us. There's yes. Satan himself, I don't think, we're not important enough. Right? Individuals, we, he's not in concern with no. us. He has other parts <laughs> of his hierarchy assigned to us. Yes. Individual demonic spirits work in the plan to kill steal and destroy the mm-hmm. great deceiver and mm-hmm. that's and that's what these devils do and so that's that's who we're up against these these spiritual being, beings uh, spiritual beings rather and 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 another scripture paul talks about in ephesians six twelve makes that point very clear as well that we are battling spiritual forces right yeah not we're not battling flesh and blood so we're not battling the people but we're battling those spirits that are operating through those people and i think that you have to understand that that's you know you can certainly tell that you've been in some battles with other people before, but to discern the difference, um, I think one of the pastors used to say, I wanted to slug that demon's head, but my husband's face kept getting in the way. And so that's a good, good way to picture that battle that you're in. You don't want to assign it to the flesh. You want to assign it to the enemy using that flesh against you to draw you into his plan, which is to kill, steal and destroy. Spiritual battle takes spiritual weapons. And right. We use that a lot in this context of marriage counseling. People need to step back and say, hey, it's not the physical world here. Yes, you are flesh and blood, but you you have you have a body, but you're, you're a soul. You know, you are a spirit and there's a soul mm-hmm. and that's the mm-hmm. battle. It's a spiritual battle trying to bring destruction upon you. Even in the realms of marriage, it's, you know, it's a spiritual battle. These devils are working to kill, steal and destroy. So that it's important to understand that, that this is a spiritual battle, not against people. Um, we've talked a little bit about demonic spirits. They're able to think um, and communicate. They have minds and wills. 
And we teach in, of the belief that spirits cannot read our minds, but that demon spirits are able to put thoughts in our mind. Right. And they, even spirits on the outside can put thoughts in a person's mind. Mm -hmm. Now, when they're inside of us, in our soulish man, mm -hmm. then that's the nature of torment. Mm -hmm. and, but demon spirits, too, can put thoughts in our mind. So I always kind of laugh a little bit, or I, I shouldn't say laugh, but I, I find it just uh, um, misleading for people to believe they're either they couch and they turn. Oh, I don't want to speak it out loud. I don't want Satan to hear what I'm saying. No. It's like, look, at, <laughs> first of all, you know, these devils already know a lot about you. Mm. You know, they don't need to read yes. your mind to know exactly what's mm. going a lot of what's going on in your line. And yes, if we pray quietly to God and we don't speak, then they don't know. But a lot of times they pick up, they see what we do. They hear what we say, and so they already know a lot about it. And fear mm -hmm. should not be in our vocabulary yeah. when it comes to dealing with the demonic realm. But the flip side is, if we want demons to do something, and, and we are able to have power and authority over them, what do we need to do? We need to we need to command them to do it, and to to speak to the demons when we want them to do something, and tell them to leave or flee. And you and I use the name and the blood of Jesus Christ when you do that, because they hate that. They hate that. Well, I like one of the scriptures that I, I noticed um, one of the pastors just teached us was that every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you're not going to bow and confess, then you need to go in the name of Jesus Christ. So you're commanding and telling them to leave and flee. That's good. I like that. We've been given power and authority over them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't need to ask God to do things in the demonic realm, right? Right. right. He's and given us power. And he's given us power and authority. And I think that a lot of times we pray incorrectly. We pray for things that are, that are already done, or we don't pray for what God is asking us to take, you know, authority over. Lots of people will say, Don, and I've heard this, oh, the battle belongs to the Lord. And it is in scripture. I, I recognize it in second Chronicles 20 and verses 15 and 16. It says, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. But then right after that, in verse 16, he says, tomorrow go down against them. So <laughs> there's a co-partnering with the Holy Spirit to go down and to, to take this war. We have a place on the front line in God's plan. And even in Hebrews 10, it says, but this man, after he had suffered sacrifice for his sins forever, Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. And from that time, he is waiting till his enemies are placed underneath his feet feet as a footstool. So we have a part in this war of, of finishing, you know, and getting that work on, on those enemies underneath his feet, um, where they, where they are, but you know, we have a plan and a part in this and because it even says in Psalm 144 that he trained our hands for battle and our, our hand, our hands for war and our fingers for battle. Right. So we are, you know, we're being trained here. Yeah. Exactly. And I love that part about and waiting until that time, until his enemies are are um, are under, are made his footstool. Right. But there's a time between a, a now and the not yet, and I, I use an analogy sometimes. And people, you know, some of the older people can relate to this. What happened in during World War II? If you want to try to put this in the natural context for understanding, in the Second World War, D Day was June 6, 1944. That was when the Allied forces were able to land on the beaches of France and establish a foothold there. And people understood. Eisenhower, Churchill understood. Even say uh, Hitler himself understood. I believe that. If, the, if they ever got a foothold on that western front there, that the war would be over. They could go there because then they could move in, the Russians from the east. And that's why he put so much time and effort, to Hitler did, to, to, to resisting that. But the re reality is, when that landing was successful and they were able to move in from there, people could look and say, okay, the war is won. The victory's been won. But, you know, that was June 6, 1944, but the but the war went on into the following year, mm -hmm. the May the following year. Mm -hmm. It was like 11 months later. There was mm -hmm. that time frame. Mm -hmm. So there was still war, right. even though the victory had been secured. Okay, right. not a perfect analogy, but I think that's it gives a good one. It, I think it, I think it works. Mm -hmm. well, the victory's been won, but there's still warfare. That we have happens. to appropriate that victory. We have to take mm -hmm. hold of it, and we still need to do some metal measure of, of battling and uh, and and against the demonic realm who mm -hmm. is still seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. So. We need to discern these devils that are out against us mm -hmm. and know their tactics mm -hmm. so we can take the appropriate um, actions against them. Right? right, 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 right. Which are? Well, you know, driving them out and resisting them, right? And I think you'll know if you need to do that, if you look at the fruit, it's what's being produced in your life. If your life is, is resonating love and joy and peace, then you're 
walking in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But if you're bound with things like anger, resentment, defeat, depression, you know, fear, then then there's a battle here that needs to be, you know, won. It, well, exactly. And, and that's the fruit. You know, what, you know, what do people need? We, we, at the very least, we talk about resisting spirits or driving out spirits and, and driving out demons. That's, that's deliverance. I mean, we talked right. about that and we'll certainly be addressing it in other podcasts, deliverance ministry 101 and others that, that, that is the driving out of demons. Um, resisting demons is the other part. It talks about in James uh, 4 7 that we need to submit to God and resist. These devils, if you like, and they will flee. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about that resisting part of it just for a moment. Uh, that, that part, because what, what is involved in, um, resisting demons? Well, I think you, in order to resist them, you've got to discern them. You know, you've got to know, um, that there's a battle that's going on. And oftentimes, if you start to rationalize or justify things as good, then, you know, the enemy is starting to call you into that that is that is not of God. I mean, there's there's a the resisting them is not coming into agreement with them and aligning your free will with them. Right? So you're talking about the mind, now, the right? mind. Yeah, you're talking about the battlefield of the mind that happens with the thoughts. Right, right, right. right. And that battle is real because demon spirits can put. Thoughts, thoughts in your mind. In right? their mind. So mm -hmm. discerning the thoughts, being resisting. And Paul, of course, other talks about, you know, I'm sure we'll elaborate these on these other podcasts about taking thought cap, thoughts captive of what we do, all that. But we, we talked about the battle. The battlefield mm -hmm. of the mind is, mm -hmm. is huge. Uh, yeah, after deliverance and apart from deliverance, right? Phyllis, we spend a lot of time with people oh, yeah. preparing them for that afterwards. Yeah. And because you've got to understand the nature of the demons and what they're speaking. You know, a lot, oftentimes when we talk about people after deliverance, Don, I'm always telling them, what are you hearing? Like if you're hearing you're unworthy or you're not good enough or, you know, you're less than, I mean, those are none of the things that God says about you. So typically to be able to clearly discern the, the, the demons tactics, you have to know the word of God and know the truth. And what you'll hear is always the opposite of the truth. So if you hear things like I, if you hear yourself saying things like first person, like I can't, I am defeated, I am sad, I am depressed, I am too weak, I am unloved, then those are nothing that God is saying. And you speak the opposite out loud that you are loved, you are the beloved, you are the apple of his eye, you have joy. Those are the ways that you can, you know, resist those demons that you've got to know their tactics in advance. Got it right. Know the tactics, discern them. Right. You right. Can't fight what you can't see. Right. You know, we use the analogy. I've used it in other places, and and about the about boxing. I mean, I'm not pretending to know a lot about boxers, but know enough about boxing that you can be the best boxer in the world. But if you're blindfolded, then you're going to be easy prey for mm -hmm. even a mediocre boxer. You blindfold a bo boxer, he can't see what he's up against. He's going to get pounded, mm -hmm. and so it is with us. You yeah, know, you know your opponent. You gotta know them. You gotta be able to discern them. Mm -hmm. You gotta dis and, and you can discern. That's the good news about the demonic spirits. We can discern them. It's a spiritual gift. God doesn't want us to be blind. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. He wants us to be aware of the devil's schemes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and so this realm of discerning of spirits, it's a gift. Ask for it. Believe you've received it. Start walking in it. Yes, you might need some training in it and, and learning how to do it, but it's, it's a gift God has for you. He wants you to have it and we need to have it. Yes to wage warfare uh, effectively. So we need to resist spirits. Um, and, and we, you know, one of the uh, scripture that people point to quite um, uh, power packed and a lot of meat in is, is the scripture in Ephesians. The, again, that warrant that tells us about the, the armor, the spiritual armor, it says to take your stand against the devil's schemes. And so what, you know, what, what do we want? To, and once again, we don't have time to, to go into all of these, you know, all the aspects of the spiritual armor. I mean, there's pastors spend, you know, weeks and months on those, <laughs> that scripture. But what, what do we want to really highlight here in terms of some of the spiritual armor that people should really become proficient in? Well, you had to have your shield of faith. You know, the Roman soldiers used to soak that shield overnight, like to get it full of water and, and, and in the natural, you know, we want to soak it in the presence of the Lord so that our shield is strong and mighty to put out the fiery darts of the enemy. You want to have the sword of the spirit.
spirit, which is the word of God. You want that, that belt of truth. You want to be walking in pe- shoes of peace, certainly have on your breastplate of righteousness and your helmet of salvation. And these aren't things, you know, I've heard people say, ah, pray them on me every day. Well, you know, just praying them on you does not mean that they're going to be on you. These are things that you need to walk in and to appropriate and to develop. Um, and so that type yeah, never of take them off. I've heard people, yeah, never take when you take, them why put them on? It's not like yeah. I put it and take it off. You know, I'm like going to bed and, yeah. and in your pajamas. It's yeah. like, no, but you know, it's one thing to look at it, but to say to learn how to walk in yes. these things and believe in, and, yeah. and, and there, like I say, there's so much there. What, what does all those elements mean? And there's some good resources, good teaching resources on those. And, and I, I like to, I mean, not, I'm not saying any more important than the others, but the, the, to me, the wonderful visual of the sword of the spirit, which mm-hmm. is the word of God. If you mm-hmm. can see in my office, yes, we, you know, have I have a sword. <laughs> we, we do, we have swords hanging up <laughs> and it's like, that is the word Amen. and to take your stand against the devil's schemes. And it's mm-hmm. such a wonderful word picture because mm-hmm. you know the, the paul in context he's talking about uh, the sword of a roman soldier right and those those were daggers if mm-hmm. you've seen the gladiator movies or whatever you know those those weren't like long zorro swords they weren't <laughs> brave heart swords they were much short daggers maybe 18 to 24 inches long they were used for infighting mm-hmm. and to resist and to defend yourself and that's what the word of god is in this context is for yes it's useful for all sorts of things for teaching rebuking correcting training and righteousness meditating on but in the context of spiritual warfare that sword will take our stand against the devil's schemes and we need to speak that thing out we need to have the scriptures like you said you need to know what the word says if you're coming against fear or depression you have the spirits that speak against fear the spirits that talk about faith god's not given me a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind if it's mm-hmm. depression you know or, or or you know that you say the joy of the lord is my strength if it's provision the lord thank you that you will provide all of my needs according to your glory glorious riches. You know, you just haven't, that's the sword Mm -hmm. of the spirit in the context of spiritual warfare. So knowing the sword or knowing the word is important. That's right. It definitely is. Need to have that. Need to have that. So resisting demons, that's, that's another element of, of, um, that we need to know how to do. So, you know, we've tried to cover a bunch of things here kind of briefly and quickly and talk about the nature of the demonic realm, who they are, how they work, uh, how they think, what their plans are, the, the, the ways we can come against them in terms of driving them out in deliverance, mm-hmm. resisting them, discerning them, mm-hmm. and being able to take up the spiritual armor of God. So Phyllis, mm-hmm. in, as we begin to to, um, to, uh, to, to bring this podcast to a conclusion. What are one or two things that you really would like people to really take away and, and really understand clearly about the demonic realm? Well, I think the key to all of it is, Scott, Don, that you need to just stay in the Word of God and to know the truth, to be able to discern where these thoughts are coming from and to realize that we're in a battle, whether we like it or we not. And we don't want to just ignore it and be a wimpy warrior that's ineffective in God's army. And so we need to know who we're, who we're in, in, in this battle with. And, and that's the key. I think that's the key. I would agree with that. That's important. We need to, we need to remember that. And, and I think that, that I, the, the realization I've come to over the years is, is that because people have such little understanding and had such uh, limited teaching on the demonic realm, they are not able to see and discern that it is the demonic realm that they're battling. You know, look, there's not demons behind every problem. People need good counsel, biblical counsel, and we need things to to do in the natural that can help us move forward. But in the realm, many times, if it's if it's a spiritual attack, you can only fight that with spiritual weapons. You need to be able to discern. If it's deliverance, if you have demon spirits tormenting you, you need to be delivered from them. If it's thoughts in the mind, demonic spirits coming to how to learn how to wage warfare in that realm. So because um, people have such limited knowledge, and for the most part, I see people getting taken out, lives destroyed, marriages destroyed, ministries destroyed, churches destroyed by the spiritual forces of evil. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So 
get the knowledge, get the information. There's some good books out there. You can contact us. We, you know, resources that have good, solid teaching about the demonic realm. Yes, reading and getting it from the word. But there's some people out there who've got some good teaching resources on that as well. And we encourage you. Anything out there by Derek Prince, Peter Horobin, the people, you know, the pigs in the parlor folks, you know, Frank and Ida Mayhem. And I mean, there's just some good resources out there. And of course, we've touched on our own manual. We've got our Glimmer's Ministry Plain and Simple Manual is our little attempt to add some some um, some knowledge to the mix as well. So get that knowledge. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast. We would love to hear from you. Uh, if you'd like to uh, leave us a question to answer, uh, you can visit our website at anbcounseling.com forward slash deliverance ministry FM to see how to do that. You can leave a question, actually record a question, an audio question, and we'll answer it on the air. Let me tell you about the giveaway we have for you. These podcasts are on iTunes. It would help us immensely if you would take the time to leave a review for us on iTunes. And if you'll do that, we will give you a, uh, we'll send you a link to our downloadable deliverance ministry plain and simple manual. It's the manual that, that's an overview of our, the way we do deliverance, talk about some of the teachings that we have and how we teach and prepare people for deliverance. We'd be happy to do that for you if you will leave us a review on iTunes. We'll have a link in the show tunes that will show you how to do that. It's going to take you to a page called our a and b counseling dot com um, forward slash review, or you can use the a and b counseling dot com forward slash deliverance ministry FM. Either one of you will get you there. I just want to briefly walk you through the process, though. When you get to iTunes and you find our station, deliveranceministry.fm, um, that comes up. You'll see a ratings and review tab at the top. Click that. Under customer reviews, you will see a white box that says, um, well, you have to click the customer reviews box, sorry. And then it says there will be a white box that says uh, write a review. That's where you write something. You write the review. Then you go back to our website, anbcounseling.com forward slash review. Short form there to fill out. Give us your information. We verify the review and send you out the copy or the instructions on how to download your manual. Look, at, we want to improve these uh, podcasts. We want them to be meaningful for you. If you have topics that you'd like us to cover, if you have suggestions for us, please do that. But leave us, leave us a review, an honest review. We'd very much love to hear from you. We appreciate the time it takes to do that. And uh, this manual is a token of our appreciation for doing that. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast.